there are a number of different things that they really fear. They don't bring up the fact that they don't have parents. They don't bring up the fact that they may not have food tomorrow. It's become kind of normal, mm. which is like, how can that be? Yeah. Lights. So bright. Are you ready? Let's go. Let's make this music flow. Let's take it to another level to show the whole world what they don't need to know. Christ is alive and he's coming back for y'all. Young, and this is the Going Home Show, a place where we look at people, families, ministries, and churches, and see where God is moving through His people. We did that for a number of years, actually, until the point came where we decided that we needed to be more um, integrated into the community. hear a lot about missions and I think there's a lot of myths and things that are out there where that people think okay that's what missions are all about we hear about volunteerism you know okay going home show thank you so much we're on the road once again in North Vancouver, this old stomping ground here for myself and uh, joining us. And this is Nick Short. Thank you, Nick, Great. for being here. Let's go, let's step into it and talk a little bit about um, what got you into ministry, Reach Out to Africa. Well, it goes back about eight years, Craig. Um, as you probably picked up from my accent, I'm not native Canadian, but I was born in Africa and uh, lived there for about 39 years. And then my family and I decided to move to, to Vancouver. And um, we'd been going back from time to time on vacation to visit family and friends and things. And about eight years ago, I took the family and we went back to South Africa and came back to Canada after that vacation and was pretty uneasy for quite a few months, actually. Um, what was making you feel uneasy? Well, the circumstances that I found myself in there with them. Um, I grew up in that environment, I knew what was going on, but I, I'd been detached from it. And then kind of decided that I had to do something. Yeah. I wasn't going to let this go, God wasn't letting me go. Um, there was a passion there that I needed to, to, to fill, there was a, a need that was obvious, and uh, I felt coming back here that I knew enough people around and I could get some guidance from people and decide that we could do something. Yeah. Everybody wants to rap and so what we, we did for a number of years was to take over volunteers and bring kids into the camp and work with them through what we call a psychosocial program. Mm -hmm. We're working both with the psychological issues and the social issues. Okay. Um, so the kids come to us from their homes and they spent a week with us, mm -hmm. uh, immersed into the program day and night. Mm -hmm. um, and we uncovered quite a lot of the, the pain and the hurt that goes with being orphaned in a very deprived environment. And so uh, we did that for a number of years actually until the point came where we decided that we needed to be more um, integrated into the community. Mm -hmm. And so we stopped the camps where the kids were coming to us mm -hmm. and we moved into the community. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the local tribal chiefs gave us a facility or we rent from him a facility in the town ship and uh, we're now based in the middle of this mm -hmm. million and a half people um, in a place called Danji mm -hmm. and uh, the kids now come to us on a day camp basis. Yeah. So they're staying in their homes but they're coming into the schools every day yeah. to work with us. And, and when you say us, um, I think for some viewers they might be thinking, oh okay, us means uh, these North Americans come and they Good come point. to us yeah. and yeah. yeah. Not at all. Um, what it is over the years we've developed a team of youth leaders. These are indigenous youth leaders. These are young African men and women, but, uh, young men and women um, who actually run our programs. What's in the program is uh, psychosocial 
uh, identifying the issues, what we call the hero book, um, where they take these children back to their last happy memories of their, ch their parents. And they take them from that time, they draw pictures of what they, yeah. how they remember their parents. And we take them through their experience since then, wow. their fears. And their fears, uh, it's interesting to see the Canadians' fears are um, not having a place to live, um, not being able to afford the latest iPhone. Maybe you can't show that. Uh, <laughs> but all the, the material things are the Canadian things. The kids' fears, surprisingly, are the fear of snakes, the fear of uh, uh, darkness. Um, the, there are a number of different things that they really fear. They don't bring up the fact that they don't have parents. Mm. They don't bring up the fact that they may not have food tomorrow. It's become kind of normal, mm. which is like, how can that be? Yeah. Um, so they uh, go through that process over a five day period. Uh, a couple of times each day to, to evolve this. By the end of the week, we're turning them from their situations and we're pointing them forward with the hope. Mm -hmm. What is the hope? The hope that is with Jesus it is with them. He will care for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what I'm hearing just uh, as you're sharing is uh, you, you're trying to take care of those needs, those needs for children, for kids to feel safe and to grow and in their development. But not only that, I'm hearing just a real organic nature of what you're doing now. It's, it's not about this simple, weak thing. It's about, okay, where's the need? Like, how can we pour into this? What, is, what do these children look like? And uh, how can we support them and encourage them? That's exactly what it's about. And it's also identifying Canadians here that have the skills that we can use, okay. that are motivated, that have the passion and the desire to make a difference, to go with us. But God works in amazing ways and uh, the fact is that the nature of African communities is about the community. Mm -hmm. So they step up and they fill the gaps mm -hmm just organically and naturally where uh, we in North America are probably a little reserved and a yeah. little shy and things like that. It's just normal. There, there, there's things that we can take away from this, Absolutely. can't we? And just and bring and uh, oftentimes it feels like when you talk about missions, when you talk about serving, that this idea that we're going to go and, and fix yeah. and be able to... That's never been an issue for us because I know uh, from experience that the people I take with me, and, and nearly 200 now, mm -hmm. uh, volunteers have gone with me to, to Southern Africa, and every one of them comes back with a story mm. that they've changed. Okay, Nick. Um, we hear a lot about missions, and I think there's a lot of myths and things that are out there where that people think, okay, that's what missions are all about. We hear about volunteerism, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, talk to us about um, why is reach out to Africa different than that, or how does that look? Yeah, we hear a lot about it as well. You know, we often get a, uh, told that that's what we're doing, volunteerism. Um, there's one simple fact that's different. We go in Christ, mm -hmm. and we're not, we're not going in business. Mm -hmm. um, so our volunteers are prepared and trained, and whoever they are, it doesn't matter whether they're Christian or non-Christian, uh, they go through the same training. Yeah. So there's an element of, of uh, sharing our experience, sharing what's anticipated, sharing what they're going to experience, mm -hmm. um, which makes, I think, a, a personal difference mm -hmm. um, before they even get there. Uh, they're aware of what we're about and what we're trying to achieve. It's the fact that Jesus is working and moving and interacting and you can't even explain it sometimes. You don't exactly. even know yeah. how it looks and it's not your job to yeah. explain it or quantify it or measure it, but your, your job to interact with what God's doing. I'm trying to bring it back to churches in North America, in, in the global north as we call it. Um, many churches are trying to experiment or try to change into what's become a missional church. Mm -hmm. um, and a missional church is a church that is, uh, everybody is involved in mission. 
not just the missions committee. Um, so we all have a role to play in the mission of Jesus. Uh, and that varies from person to person. Mm -hmm. In the same way that people that we take on our teams have a role to play. Some of them don't even realize at the time when they go what their role is yet. But they, they tend to find out when they experience what they do over there. You know, coming together and listening to the stories of some of these young adults and some of these kids that have been abused multiple times, uh, been victimized in so many ways, and then having lost their parents as well, mm -hmm. added to that. Uh, it really brings a reality mm -hmm. check, and it brings Jesus right in there. Mm -hmm. um, without them having to know a whole lot of stuff, without them having, they feel it. <laughs> I'm hearing a lot of uh, just fresh, innovative perspective on missions and, and the ministry that you're doing. Um, I had the blessing and the joy to be part of one of your uh, dinners that you had uh, here locally, uh, last night actually. Talk to us about that dinner and how it was different. Okay, traditionally we do the fundraising dinner and the silent auction and, and we've done that every year for eight years now. Last night was our eighth, uh, uh, what we call changing lives dinner. And um, decided early on that we had to do something different. The broad concept is there are 960 million people in the world who have no food security, who do not know whether they're gonna get a meal today or tomorrow or the next day. Um, so they're kind of in survival mode and I kind of thought, you know, we are North America, we just don't have a clue as to how this uh, affects people. So putting this together we decided we would uh, invite a bunch of people and segment off a bunch that are going to really enjoy the normal meal they would experience. So it was like Roughly like 15%. Yeah, 15% of, yeah. of the of 100 people yeah. uh, get to enjoy a full meal. There's another 35% that are reasonably secure. They anticipate, it may not be great, but they anticipate having food on the table on a regular basis. Um, and they would just enjoy a more watered down meal for the evening. And then the vast majority, the 50% of the people who came last night just got a bowl of rice and some water. Uh, they felt challenged in a sense that there were people in the world today who were doing that, eating that, and that's all they can have today yeah, they'd and tomorrow. They'd be fortunate if they were to get... Many of them, yeah. absolutely. There are many that starve every day and don't, don't get a guaranteed meal every, mm -hmm. every day. So it really challenged them in that regard. And they came to me and said um, that they felt that way, which is mm -hmm. obviously the goal we were trying to share was that there are many people in the world and including in Canada yeah. who are hungry mm -hmm. and who don't have any food security and uh, we do have the capacity to do something about it. So here we are, we've reached the end, so what, what now? Where, where do we go with this? What do we do? Well, we need to pray, we need to act, we need to be the body of Christ. Thank you so much, Nick, for coming by on the show. Hey, I have one last question. Nick, where are you going? I'm going home.